Life has its ups and downs, its high points and its lows. Just as we thought things were getting better and the Covid threat level was beginning to diminish, so the world is plunged into what could be a long, destabilising and totally unnecessary war. How do we cope with the ups and downs of life? How do we handle joy and sorrow, favour and disapproval? Can we really meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same? How can we be positive, purposeful and progressive, especially with everything that is going on? Being positive is, I think, something about a presumption of generosity. A sense may be that God has endowed the world with goodness. Being positive is about knowing that God is God, that he is on our side. In our Gospel reading, Jesus has been reflecting with his disciples on the nature of sacrifice. And then we're told he goes up a high mountain and he takes with him Peter and James and John, his closest and most trusted friends. And he was transfigured before them. It was a vision of the glory of the Lord, but it was a vision that came not when Jesus had risen from the dead, but before, before his trial, before his suffering, before his death upon the cross. A temporary high point, an up, before the tough times that lay ahead. The anarchist writer Hakim Bey talks about a temporary autonomous zone, a kind of short-lived utopia, an opportunity to live differently even if it is for only a moment. Maybe that's how we should think of the transfiguration of Jesus, as a temporary autonomous zone, a breaking free of all that constrained him in his earthly life, an opportunity to live differently, even if it was only for a moment. And we need these moments, these high points, the, if we are to inject hope into the daily struggles and trials that we face. Kester Bruin, in an excellent book called Other, says that the forces at work against us are huge, but brief festivals of hope are taking place. They are temporary flashes of light in dark places, he says. But long after they are gone, the air hangs heavy with a generous odour, and those who think they saw something different are, in minuscule ways, penetrated by the marvellous for a second, and can never get rid of that feeling. These festivals of hope and temporary flashes of light that Kester Bruin talks about remind us that God is God, they give us a taste of God's glory and they transfigure all that follows, even the low points and the struggles that we face. For Jesus, it also had something to do with the affirmation that he is God's son, his chosen one. Festivals of hope, a, a flash of light in the darkness, a sense of God's glory and the affirmation that you're God's beloved child and that he's chosen you. You are his. Where might that injection of positivity come from? Well, it might be an experience of God in worship. It might be an event or a retreat or a festival. It might be an overseas trip or some kingdom-focused activity. It might just come from spending time with God in silent prayer, just sensing his presence. We need to seek moments such as these if we are to be positive. Maybe that's how we should see Lent rather than it be 40 days of downcast deprivation. We need to be positive, but we also need to be purposeful. In the account of the Transfiguration, it says that Jesus was with Moses and Elijah and they were speaking about his departure, his exodus, which he was about to bring to fulfilment in Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah talked with Jesus about his forthcoming death. But Luke uses the word departure, exodus. And you don't need to know much Old Testament to see the significance of that word. Jesus is going to bring to fulfilment a new exodus. Just as the original exodus was a saving departure, so Jesus' passing through the deep waters of death would involve once more the release of captives. Moses, in the first exodus, released those who were captive in Egypt, those who were slaves to Pharaoh. And once free, once released from bondage, the people became God's people. Jesus, in this new exodus, this new departure, releases those who were slaves to sin, held captive by their own rebellion against God. 
Jesus releases us from bondage and he makes us God's people. In a very real sense, the death of Jesus was an exodus, a saving departure. Jesus, the Son of God, and precisely because he was God's Son, is God's Son, felt it necessary to go to Jerusalem and to die. The next time that Jesus was with his disciples, he sat down with them and he said, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But the disciples didn't understand. Again, he took the twelve aside and he told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Later on still, Jesus tells a story about a man who owned a vineyard and about the tenants who mistreated the servants whom he'd sent and then ended up killing the son of the owner of the vineyard. The vineyard was Israel, the servants, the prophets, and the son who was killed. It couldn't be plainer. A little later, and while at dinner, Jesus was anointed as if for his death. Then at the Passover, he talks about his blood being poured out for many. The events of his arrest, trial and death are what follows. God said, listen to him. And Jesus simply spoke of his death and then bid his disciples come and follow me. The glory of God witnessed by Peter, James and John came at a price. They also had to listen to Jesus as Jesus took them to his and to their Calvaries. Following Jesus is about listening to God, discovering God's purpose for our lives, heeding his call, his call to follow, perhaps to suffer, maybe even to die. We need to be positive, we need to be purposeful, but also progressive. We need to look forwards. These temporary flashes of light, these moments of glory are temporary, and you cannot hold on to that moment forever. In the account of the transfiguration in Luke, there's a lovely moment when the disciples don't know what to say until Peter, their spokesman, says to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. And of course, what he was asking was, can we preserve this moment? Can we stay here basking in the glory? Do we have to leave and all this evaporate and just become a memory? Of course, he couldn't have his shelters. The transfiguration was a moment in time and time moves on. There were things to do. And we in the church need to learn, though, from Peter's question and the fact that he couldn't get what he wanted. There is a terrible tendency in all our churches, whatever the tradition, to hold on to what should be temporary and to preserve flashes of the numinous. But as our former glories fade, We convince ourselves that what was is far better than anything that has come after. Past languages, the music of old, the way we used to do things. All too often we seek to preserve them, to resist moving on. Surely, by resisting change, we think we can hold on to something of that glory. But it doesn't work like that. Gabriel Daly says of the church that hope for the future is all too easily frustrated by the dead hand of the past, when fresh insights are measured against old formularies, and when tradition, instead of being understood as a living thing, is reduced to dogmas which are entombed in the ruins of past cultures. All too often we show ourselves wedded to the desire to make permanent that which should be temporary. Melba Magay, a theologian from the Philippines, says that what happens is that organisations such as the church begin as a movement, prophetic and exciting and glorious perhaps, and proceeding by new and untried means. Then things get regularised and formularised, jobs and positions of authority are given out, a structure forms and the movement becomes a machine. And then there is a danger that if the organisation loses sight of its purpose, then it becomes a monument, cold and grey and static. If we try to preserve things, if we try to cling to our former glories, then all we shall have left of our once glorious church will be a cold, grey, static monument. If I'm honest, 
I'd have been with Peter, though. I'd have wanted to stay on that mountain. I'd have wanted that moment to last. But life, as we know, has its ups and its downs, its high points and its lows. And no sooner had the vision faded than it was time for them to go back down from the mountain, to get back down to earth. That's a lovely expression, down to earth. The Latin for earth, humus, gives us the words humble and humility. And humility is about being down to earth and also choosing the lower place. Hand in hand with the temporary moments of glory must come these acts of humility, this willingness to choose, to occupy the lower place. Of course, when Jesus and Peter and James and John came down from the mountaintop, straight away they encountered failure. Luke says on the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met Jesus. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him and all at once he shrieks, It throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Life does have its ups and its downs, its high points and its lows. And here, as happened so often in my experience, Jesus and Peter and James and John move from a a really great experience to one that brings them crashing, crashing back down to earth. And things from that moment were only going to get worse as Jesus is arrested, then executed in a bloody and brutal way. How did the one experience, that of seeing Jesus transfigured, relate to all that followed? How did those three disciples make sense of the ups and downs and high points and low points of their lives? Was it, as Kester Bruin says, that long after those moments were gone, the air hung heavy with a generous odour? Did the transfiguration give them some lasting sense of positivity and purpose and progressiveness during the very dark, dark days that lay ahead? We need to seek and nurture and evoke a sense of positivity, fuelled by festivals of hope and temporary flashes of light. We need to hold to a sense of purpose, listening to God, and heeding his call, his call to follow, maybe to suffer, certainly to give ourselves up for God. And we need to be progressive, to look forwards with hope, rather than trying to cling to former glories. Being positive and purposeful and progressive helps us to cope with those moments when we come crashing back down to earth. For life, it seems to me, should have its ups and its downs, its high points and its lows, its brief encounters with glory and maybe its patient times of humility and service and also endurance. High highs and low lows. Isn't that how life should be? Not a flat line. A flat line, says Wikipedia, is a measure, a measurement that shows no activity and is often involved in various definitions of death. The lovely American youth pastor Mike Iaconelli, sadly no longer with us, likened the Christian life to a ride on a roller coaster. And he said, my life has been up and down, careening left then right, full of mistakes and bad decisions. If I died right now, he said, even though I would love to live longer, I could say from the depths of my soul, what a ride. What a ride. Whatever happens, whatever is going on, It is still good to try and find ways of being positive, purposeful and progressive. Take care. Amen.